I would now like to tell you a few words about our next feature, Jackson Gilman. Jackson now comes from Wareham area of Cape Cod. He grew up in Middletown, New York. As a child, he said he loved to watch the Audubon movies, which were uh, shown in town, and he would taxi out to go see them, although his parents weren't all that keen on learning about uh, nature in that way. And he said that in his teens, he loved climbing trees and spending time in trees. And he went on to uh, study human ecology in college and went on to work in the trees a bit as an arborist and also as a cider maker and a maple sugarer and a landscaper and arborist. And he said one summer he decided to do something completely different and that was to be a singing waiter at a restaurant. <laughs> and that job, he discovered a devotion and an ease and a great joy in performing stories and songs. And soon he received the leading role of musical ensembles. Uh, and he started doing some choreography. And he developed a solo act. And he uh, dug into this new art. And he went on to study many forms of dance and music and took workshops with mimes and ment uh, other mentors. And then Jackson went on to tour with children's theater companies and established his own solo performing career as a mime, an actor, a songsmith, and a storyteller. And since then, he has been featured as a performer in the National Storytelling Festival in Tennessee and performed at festivals and schools throughout the country. He's also hosted a summer concert series at the Mount Desert Island and has had the privilege of being Rudyard Kipler Kipling in Rudyard in Residence at his Vermont home. And so now, year-round, he brings his unique brand of one-man theater to diverse audiences across the nation. And when I asked Jackson why share stories, poems, and songs out in the world with others, he said, I'll quote Mary Oliver to answer that. Instructions for living a life, pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. And now I'd like to introduce Jackson Gilman to do that very thing for you. One more, please say good morning to Jackson Gilman. Do we see ourselves in fish? <clears throat> Recognize our pre-reptilian past and long to get back in touch with our saline roots? Maybe that's why we fish. Or don a mask, tank, and fins and go for a dive. And might not a fish wish to don a footed dry suit, cap itself with a rising bell filled with compressed water, out itself and go for a hike? Or maybe go fishing for you. Bait a wiener on the line and cast it onto the picnic table. Wait. Nibble, hook, ooh, play the line a little bit, fight, ooh, if you were a whopper, it might take a whole school to reel you down and water you. <laughs> then get shown off to other schoolmates, get weighed and have your picture taken. <laughs> <laughs> if you were lucky and they were sporting fish, they'd toss you back out on the shore. Catch and release. <sighs> With a bit more cortex and opposable finlets, who knows? Going manning might be their pastime of choice. <laughs> Just like fishing. It's in the blood. <laughs> well, here's a poem written by a deaf woman, and it's called The Language of the Eye by Dorothy Miles. <clears throat> Hold a tree in the palm of your hand, or topple it with a crash. <coughs> Sail a boat on finger waves, or sink it with a splash. From your fingertips see a frog leap in a passing butterfly. The word becomes the picture in this language of the eye. 
follow the sun from rise to set. Or bounce it like a ball. Ooh, catch a fish in a fishing net or swallow it, bones and all. Make traffic scurry. Airplanes fly. People meet and part. The word becomes the action in this language of the heart. And I'm attracted to poems and songs and stories that create really strong visual images. And that's the case with this next story. And I got to perform it on a very special occasion. My father had just returned home from the hospital, recovering nicely from a heart attack. And he had friends over for dinner. And you might remember being a child and your parents having friends over for dinner. And if you had some talent, like playing an instrument or tap dancing or something, they'd, they'd trot you out there and have you show off for them. And if you were like me, you'd kind of like duck and cover. <laughs> Uh, unless you were a born ham, which I, I couldn't have been because we were raised kosher. But um, I, I thought that once you got to be an adult, they would stop doing that to you. <laughs> but no, no, no. Sure enough, after dinner, they said, Jackson, tell a story. Well, I, I was ready with a story uh, to celebrate my father's health. And I knew it was one that he'd appreciate the source of. It's an old Hasidic tale. Uh, perhaps first credited to, to Rabbi Nachman of Braslo. It appeared in the Dybbuk, the Tale of the Seven Beggars. The Traveling Yiddish Theater did a version, as did my friend Martin Steingesser, and, and I've had my way with it too now. And so I love this piece. It seems to get more timely because there's an image of it about life being held together by a thread. And as our planet gets assaulted and we have so much challenges keeping healthy in this world, I think that that, that image of this thread is really critical. And I'm just hope we don't understand it, but I'm just hoping that this cosmic thread retains its strength and its magic. So my father's tears of appreciation were perhaps the best reward I've ever gotten for a story. And it's called the heart of the world. At one end of the world, there's a mountain. And on this mountain, there is a rock. And from this rock, there flows a spring. Now, at the other end of the world, there lives the great heart of the world. Now, you all know that each thing has a heart. And the world itself has a at heart of its own, and it's beating. That's what keeps the world alive. Now, the great heart of the world sees the spring, and it is filled with desire, it is filled with longing, it is filled with love for the spring. And of course, it wants to be closer to his beloved. And so he leaves his place, and he starts to move. And as he's approaching the mountain from which flows the spring, he realizes that if he takes another step, he will no longer be able to see the top. He will lose sight of the spring. And if the great heart of the world should lose sight of his beloved, even for an instant, then he will die. And the world will die. And all the, the creatures of the world will die. So the great heart of the world stops where he can still see the spring. And now all he can do is look. He can only look. But then he notices that the sun is going down. And he realizes that when darkness comes and night falls, he, he will no longer be able to see the spring. He will lose sight of his beloved, and he is going to die anyway. And all the creatures of the world, too. So the great heart of the world pours out his sorrow in a song. He sings to his spring. And the spring hears it. And she answers it with her song. And these two songs, they meet in the air, and they become one song. This one song spreads across the earth, along with the colored rays of sunset, which pours out and touches the hearts 
of all the creatures and it awakens their song. And just at the moment, the sun is going down and all of life is joined together in this outpouring of color and of song. There walks on the earth one of the just, one of the shining, a Lamed Vavnik. And she is a weaver. And she gathers all these heart songs and these colored rays of light and of love. And she weaves them. She weaves them into time. Just enough time to make another day. So that all of the hearts can live one more day. While we're still in that mood in those images, this is a more contemporary piece that I wrote. It's called Love Cycles. He left the sea many, many lives ago. She lingered, always keeping one foot on the shore. He was drawn to the mountains and he communed with the trees. She craved the ocean, savored her air and sailed her waves. He had the loftiest of hopes, and she, the deepest. He would like to live near a stream, like a tree, growing higher and wider, his roots always reaching for her perpetual flow. She would live on the water, feeling the roots of her past, very content in knowing that she was the source of all life's cycles. They were there for each other, and in that they gloriously flourished. His waters fed her, and she lovingly reined herself on him. Earlier I told this story that I was inspired to tell to my father. This is this one that I was inspired to, to create for my son. It's called Twice Blessed and has a little soundtrack.
lucky man. I am twice blessed. And the reason why you might have guessed. And to my dying day, I'm your biggest fan. While I walk this earth, I can hold your hand. This other son is one I can touch. He's my boy that I love so much. And he as well lights up my life. He came courtesy of my darling wife. I've got two sons. They make me feel so fine. I'm so grateful for these sons of mine. When I lay you down to sleep, I thank the stars in the ocean deep for the warmth you bring. So to you I sing, my wondrous son, you're a precious thing. I've got two sons, I treasure them both. And while I'm living, I will take this oath. For the one on earth, I will do my part. I love you, son, with all my heart. My two bright sons, they make me feel so fine. I'm so grateful for these sons. My two bright sons, they make me feel so Fine. I'm so grateful for these sons of mine. Even when days are gray, you always bring me joy. My sunny I'm going to let you sing along this time. And sometimes we overlook these simple nursery rhymes that we grew up with and think they're just like these silly little numbers. But uh, we're going to delve a little deeper into the Eensy Weensy Spider <laughs> with the help of Bob Blue and Tom Smith, who started writing this song together. And, uh, and then I added some things myself. And we're going to take a, borrow a tune from Stan Rogers, because it's got a great sing-along chorus that you can help me with. And we're going to plumb the depths of this little nursery rhyme and see what we can take with us on our journeys through life. The eensy weensy spider went up the water spout. Down came the rain and washed that spider out. Out came the sun and dried up all the rain. And the eensy weensy spider climbed again. She wouldn't let the elements distract her from her goal. The purpose of her struggle was embedded in her soul. Now see the sun shine down on beasts, on women, and on men. Be like that eensy weensy spider. Rise again, rise again, rise again. She won't let rainstorm deter her from doing what she she can, and whether your legs number two, or four, or eight, or ten, be like that eensy weensy spider, rise again. Next time that chorus is in, you can join me with the fingers too. <laughs> this eensy weensy metaphor is a lesson for us all. We cannot be defeated if we rise each time we fall. And if you think this story is one you've heard too long ago, then think about some other ones you know. You know the myth of Sisyphus. And you know Jack and Jill, it's such a potent image going up and down a hill. So every time you fall or lose a loved one or a friend, 
Be like that incy weensy spider. Rise again, rise again, rise again. Don't let losses deter you from doing what you can. Help me now with your fingers. And whether your legs number two, or four, or eight, or ten, be like that incy weensy spider. Rise again. Sometimes in life you'll find that there are hurdles in your way. You can find ways to get over or turn and wait, walk away. Mountains turn to molehills if you're not afraid to schlep. The longest climb starts with a single step. Whether wind is blowing at you or kindly at your back, discouragement is baggage. Faith is what you need to pack. So enjoy the going forward and the progress you have made. Don't let the storms in life rain down on your parade. And rise again, rise again. Don't let hurdles deter you from doing what you can. And whether your legs number two or four or eight or ten, be like that incy weensy spider, rise again. Perhaps you think this allegory goes a bit too far. Climbing up a pipe is not like reaching for a star. But whether it's a water spout or mountain that you've climbed, you've come this far, indulge me one more time. It could be said that each of us climbs up a water spout. The downward pull of gravity is not what it's about. The upward pull of hope is what will save us in the end. Be like that incy weensy spider. Rise again, rise again, rise again. Don't let backslides deter you from doing what you can. And whether your legs number two, or four, or eight, or ten, be like that incy weensy spider. Rise again. Heather and I, we like to travel together whenever we can. So when I had a meeting in Gether, we started making plans. Now we've never been much of travelers and we really didn't know that Gether was the hardest place we'd ever try to go. So we went down to the stations for our tickets and applied for trips ending in Gether, not expecting to be guiled. So now we'd like to go together, together on this very day, and return from Gether together with Heather later in the day. For I have this day in Gether a meeting to attend at nine, and I'd like to be together with Heather tonight and Gether to dine. Said he to me, now let me see if I have heard you right. Heather and you would like to go together to dine together tonight. Then he replied, I have here in my own little hand just one ticket together, so I cannot meet your demand. So you can go together, but Heather must sadly wait. For the next train together will make you very late. Said I, my friend, it seems to me you're tripping through your feathers. I did a rhyming dictionary and I had to get feathers in there somehow. <laughs> the train together yesterday had many seats for Heathers. Said he, you can't go together together on this very line because due to weather and gather, some trains are not on time. Said I, I'd like to go together and must go today and get together together with Heather without more delay. Well, well, said he to me, you really mustn't moan. I've got one ticket together, so one must go alone. I was so disappointed, was sad enough to cry. Our trip together, together, just wasn't going to fly. But then he looked up and said with a happy little smile, there's a later train together that's scheduled in just a while. So while you can't go together, together at this very time, you both can get together and be together to dine. I was so elated, I was happy enough to smile, for we could be together and gather in just a little while. So now you all can see together, at the end of this little tome, two can get together together, if each will go alone. <laughs> Listening to Mendelssohn. Sounds of sorrow, slow, sounds drawn out by somber resin on silken strands. Why, 
yearned sorrow so. Why? What then? Why? What then? The prayerful glow in darkest night wafting low on solitary note. Ah, Mendelssohn, it's in your soul, reverberating throughout time until the tremble turns to tremolo, turns with pluck and bow in wordless soliloquy, falling and rising again and then, again and when, again in wild ecstasy, until its fervor can no longer hide its undersong and the wistful melancholy returns, begins to call again, come, and the dancer behind my eyes responds with the soulful energy of the ebb and tide, extends her arm to touch each swollen pause, the palpable informed. When again the slow, low trembling turns, again to ride, like poetry, the rise into the vast indigo space between the lines and the dancer and the dance, and the resounding counterpoint takes flight, all wind and wing and gut rushing forward, rushing on toward home with all its might, with all our vows before sorrow keens its final note. Why, what then? The stillness throbs in smaller and smaller amounts until all sense disappears and hangs forever in the air. <laughs>